You can't talk about art history without seeing the impact Catholicism has had on art and the impact that art has had on Catholicism. It's time for our monthly art history lesson with Charles and Amanda Shepard from the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. This is Kyle Hyman. I am here at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art with Charles and Amanda Shepard here for my monthly art history lesson. Are you getting any smarter about this, Kyle? I'm I'm nearly an art genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy to be. No, I feel like we're just scratching the surface, just barely putting a dent in things. That's okay. We're always here for you. I'm I'm glad. <laughs> Maybe 50 years from now, I'll be like, hey, I th- I think I know a little bit about art. Good. No, so what do we have today? So, if you've been following along our series together, we've been talking about Catholic art as it was used in the Catholic Restoration following the period of the Protestant Reformation Mm -hmm. and how uh, the Council of Trent didn't necessarily use art as a primary means to help reinvigorate the faithful, but it was a means and they acknowledged its importance and therefore the church, wealthy patrons and artists all mobilized to use their particular talents to keep the faithful engaged about the sacraments their importance, their effects, and uh, reaffirm what the church teaching was up until that point, which was in the uh, 16th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In this evolution uh, from the artistic side, it's important to note that as the church wanted to make a stronger and stronger impression on the people, changes in the way art was made were happening, uh, an art that might be more emotional, that might have a stronger narrative. The colors might grasp the eye uh, with more vigor than they might have in the High Renaissance or the Mannerist era. And that's kind of fascinating to see that the impact that, that the church was having with these commissions. Mm-hmm. Sure. And the art of this time was in direct contrast to the art of the Middle Ages, which is more flat there's not a lot of depth of field. The figures aren't very lifelike. You don't see a realistic anatomy. You don't see a lot of action. You don't see a lot of life. So the painting and the sculpture of the Catholic Restoration and of the periods Charles was talking about, a lot of action, a lot of energy, a lot of naturalism, even if some artists went a little overboard with the energy and the action and the flowing silks and the very muscular figures, it was very lifelike compared to what had been, what had come before it. Hmm. And the theory would be that the viewer could identify with actual figures, natural looking figures, as opposed to idealized figures that might have been copied from a sculpture, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. I, don't, I don't know anybody that looks like that or that or that, but I do recognize that these these look like real people, and they're involved in some serious uh, stories to move for the Catholic cause on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, we picked out a painting that continues our discussion of the church's commitment to the sacraments, mm-hmm. that many of them were under attack by the reformers, Eucharist and penance being the two biggest that were rejected by the reformers. Baptism wasn't so much rejected as it was argued about. Mm. Uh, The two main points that were argued about were the effects of baptism and the age at which one should be baptized. And the first argument, you know, the reformers would say, well, once I've been baptized, I'm good, Mm. I'm saved. The Catholic Church would say, yes, but you're going to continue to commit sins and you need penance and the Eucharist to return yourself to the state of baptism. Yeah. Uh, so, a little bit of a circle here. Yeah. Sure. We, yeah. <laughs> we're humans and we're going to continue to fall. Yeah. So, that that was something that the church wanted to reinforce with the faithful and then also the age of baptism. The church has always taught that infant baptism is the best case scenario. Mm-hmm. Of course, one can be baptized at any point when they come to the church. But then there were some literal reformers that would claim, no, it needs to be at age 33 when Christ was or it needs to be at the age of a consenting adult. Mm-hmm. So, artists use both of those points in their work. And in particular, in the painting that we're going to talk about today is The Baptism of Christ by Anibale Karachi uh, from 1585. It was an altarpiece for the Church of Santi Gregorio Isiro 
in Bologna, which is uh, the native town of the Karachi. And we'll get to talk about who the Karachi are. They're okay. three relatives who formed a school, all being of the family Karachi. Huh. <laughs> so this an art, art school sure yeah okay. an academy yeah mm -hmm. well, an academy that was that was known in common conversation as the academy of desire for fame and learning <laughs> <laughs> so they, they didn't have modest goals <laughs> right right sure right. yeah, yeah. Uh, they're they're honest about it though right, right. <laughs> these are so goals the school <laughs> was founded by Anibale Ludovico and Agostino in Bologna and joking aside the school was focused on drawing from life rather than ancient sculpture uh, infusing a freshness or an electric urgency um, a lot of uh, huh. action and immediacy on the part of the viewer and interestingly Anibale was buried in the Pantheon next to his hero Raphael huh. yeah well, that was a fun fact yeah <laughs> so let's get to this painting it was an altarpiece for this church and it depicts Christ being baptized by John the Baptist Christ and John are the two main figures and Christ is at the very center. He bisects the painting hmm. almost 100% symmetrically. Mm -hmm. And though he is our main point of focus, he is bowing in, sum in submission and his hands are crossed over his right, the right side of his chest, which is a symbol of submission and humility. And he's looking down. So if this were an altarpiece, it would have presided over the altar oh, where yeah. the Eucharist was celebrated. Huh. So we have a really interesting connection between baptism and the Eucharist. And I see it as, as you are worshiping the Eucharist and about to receive the Eucharist, you're reminded of the promises of baptism and how the Eucharist can bring us back to that innocent state uh, of baptism. So there's a really strong connection between Jesus's baptism and his holy sacrifice as well. Sure. So then in the background, we see mothers holding infants, mm -hmm. which is symbolic of the church's teaching of bringing your infants to baptism. Mm -hmm. And to Christ and John's right there on the left side of the painting, we have sort of a busy activity of three or four men who all kind of seem to be uh, not arguing, but they are in conversation about what's happening. They're pointing to the scene and mm -hmm. they're in white robes and they are talking to each other about what's happening and uh, possibly discussing the power of this scene. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I was talking to Charles about before we sat down together is why are John the Baptist and Christ in scarlet robes, but everybody else in the scene are in white robes? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, John and Jesus are the two martyrs in this scene, and perhaps <sighs> it's their blood that saves us. Right. Christ's blood being saving, right. but of course, John the Baptist also uh, a martyr as well. And they're the two figures that, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are bringing about our salvation. Mm -hmm. um, I like that, yeah. But that salvation comes with blood. Right. Um, right. Sacrifice. Sure. And again, being over the altar, it would have been always presiding over the perpetual sacrifice of, of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Now, the Karachi trio is with this painting and the ones that will follow – setting up a whole new emphasis within the picture plane of balance, uh, as you mentioned, action, but that it has symmetry, that Christ is in the middle, mm -hmm. and the and his being baptized is the central thing, and these figures around the side are either looking to the scene or pointing to the scene, like, you, the viewer, do you get this? Yeah. This is Christ being baptized by John the Baptist. Right. And heretofore... This is what you would call the Baroque approach. Just prior to this, the Mannerist approach was what all artists were doing. And the Mannerists had no symmetry. They distorted and elongated legs, necks, body parts. And it was sort of to show off their you know, virtuosity of the artist. I can manipulate the human form in this direction and that direction. And Anibali Karachi and his brother and his, his uncle – are saying, no, 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 let's bring this back to what's important. Mm -hmm. You know, 
we want to paint in a way that the point is not going to get lost and all this contorted stuff it, you're losing the point mm-hmm. so so they really sort of single-handedly changed the style of art from mannerists which then faded away entirely to baroque which was you know celebrated greatly huh. practical question for you mm-hmm. when we're looking at a painting that's 500 years old mm-hmm. are we seeing the colors as they remained over time or is this a restoration what generally happens is that d- depending on the material first of all okay if, if it's oil paint you're you're gonna have cleaning problems but you're not gonna have distortion of color because okay. the pigment is going to endure for hundreds of years if it were huh. a watercolor or or a print or something those inks or those different kinds of pigmentation in the watercolor those change with the exposure to light which mm-hmm. this will not plus you got to figure in the as altar pieces or anywhere else in the church uh, the lighting is never going to be severe on these so the first thing that happens is restoration people come in and they'll just clean mm-hmm. and the, the most efficient this is going to sound overly simplistic, but the most efficient way to clean an oil painting is they do it with a swab and saliva. And saliva has enough really acid acid in it to get the dirt off without touching the oil paint. And this you can't imagine how long this takes, though. Yeah. A museum that I've been at in the past, we had a conservation department. And so you get to witness them cleaning these centuries-old paintings, and you think – I can't believe how brilliant it is uh-huh. once you get the the muck off it. Yeah, you know, the, and this is candle soot and other things, um, right? That are going to be natural in, in homes and in the church. Uh-huh. Uh, and all you find, okay, well, that red is really the red. Yeah, yeah. Now, in some cases, if you've lost pigmentation, flaking, scratching, in, in those cases, they're going to study that color with spectrometers and then reproduce that. Mm -hmm. But most of these are taken care of just by real cleaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as Charles said, this painting is still in that church. And it's amazing to think that a lot of this famous work by these famous artists, they haven't all been usurped by the big galleries and museums of Italy. Some have, Uh but this remains in that church. I don't know what the lighting situation is like (laughs) in that church, but I'm guessing they don't have hot gallery lights right above their altar. Uh You know, it's probably natural light. Charles said the candles. Um, The church is probably somewhat modernized. I'm betting there's light in there somewhere. But um, Charles is right. Oil paint maintains its color for a very long time or um egg tempera which is egg yolk and pure pigment that is that has even more longevity and is considered the superior paint huh. yeah well it, it, it's incredible and i had the chance to experience this in graduate school doing the cathedral tour in europe and day after day sometimes Several times within a day, you're seeing masterpieces that are in every book that you've ever studied, and they're right there on the wall. And there's not a security guard, and there's not an alarm system generally, and no gallery lighting, as you say. Your breath is taken away. Yeah. It's extraordinary. So without special lighting on an altarpiece like this, the, the artist had to invent his own source of light. And in the one that we're looking at, the light is coming from the left side of the painting and it's illuminating the foot of Christ as he's Hmm. his knee is coming out toward us and he's walking toward us almost like he's about to step out of the painting onto the altar so (sighs) whatever light there was in that church you would see his right shoulder his knee and his foot which is white Mm -hmm. and then you'd also see the white as it's reflected onto the figures to his right right um so The artist knew that with natural lighting or candlelight, what would we most want to see? And he's careful to keep Christ at the center Mm -hmm. and highlight certain body parts that would remind us of who we're looking at. His his face is almost in the shadows. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Because his head's down. Right. That's a really interesting in humility. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'll, again, I'll put the the image of this or a link to it in the show notes so people can check that out. But uh, what else is going on here at the museum? 
We are, uh, in the month of July, about to close a couple of really cool shows. So before August, I invite our viewers to come see Marlena Rose, who looks back into ancient cultures to create contemporary sand cast glass sculptures. And then Doc Thrash is an African-American artist who spent his career in the early to mid 20th century depicting African-Americans um, seeking a better life hmm. uh, and he also invented a special printmaking process uh that that um you know pioneered the medium all right well people can check it out stop by the museum or fwmoa.org that's right and also on social media sure all right thank you so much charles and amanda thank you thank you, thank you.